Good evening, everybody. Man, it's good to be back with you tonight. I hope that you enjoy Sunday nights. I think about all of the Bible lessons that I learned on Sunday nights growing up as a kid. And really, those lessons are irreplaceable. And so I know that I'm grateful to be together, and I hope that you are too. We started today, this morning, a study that will lead us to Easter. And kind of as we have roughed out some of that, and even beyond Easter, maybe even through Pentecost. And so I'm excited about that as we think about not only the life of Jesus, but we think about the followers of Jesus, as we think about the story of Jesus, both those that he interacted with specifically, but then also how that relates to us and the call of the cross, and everything else. And so I'm excited about that. I know that the Lord has a lot in store for us over the next several weeks, the next couple of months even. And I'm excited to hear that good news message every week and then to apply those messages to us right on the ground as the church, as God's people. So I hope that you are too. Let's pause for just a minute. Ask God to bless our time together. And then we will jump in and we'll study. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for every opportunity that you give us. I'm grateful for our church family here at Netherland. And I pray that you would bless our time together. Father, tonight we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for Jesus every night. But Father, as we think about Jesus on a high level, we're grateful for him. And we're thankful for what he does for us. So, Father, I pray that we would see Jesus in the gospel tonight and that we would see the stories that the men who wrote the New Testament, specifically the gospels, uh, that they record and that that would make us love him even more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is true that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? We would all agree with that, that the Holy Spirit inspired men and carried along those men to write the New Testament and ultimately to reveal the good news of salvation. But what's also interesting is if you do a little bit of word study, and Mark did a little bit of that this morning, and and we do that from time to time, if you look at the New Testament books as a whole, you also have to understand that the Holy Spirit did not 100% possess these guys. There was different flavor in every gospel. There was different backgrounds that every New Testament author and every gospel author carried into whatever that looked like as the Holy Spirit carried that man along. Still inerrant, absolutely. I think the Holy Spirit covered over some of that humanity that could cause errors, but Matthew was still Matthew. Mark was still Mark, right? Luke was still Luke. And so they had the different backgrounds and perspectives And the Holy Spirit didn't gloss over all of that. And so what's really interesting, what's always been interesting to me when I've thought about the New Testament story, and specifically the story of Jesus, is how differently he is portrayed in every gospel. It's not that those portrayals are in conflict with each other, but that they work in concert together, right? So they help one another. But every gospel has a different audience. And so every gospel has a different motif or a different point. There are different things that the gospel writers are trying to prove through the story of Jesus. And really, if you look as a whole at how Jesus is revealed in every gospel, I think it gives just such a complete picture of what Jesus was doing, both for Jews and for Gentiles. So, I want us to look at the big, broad picture of who Jesus is in all four of the Gospels. So, the Gospel of Matthew. Ultimately, what the Gospel of Matthew tries to say about Jesus is that Jesus is is the Messiah or Savior. Those words are essentially the same. When you hear the word Savior, what comes to your mind? What do you think of when you hear that word Savior? Do you have a mental image that comes to mind? 
when you hear that word? Savior. The one who can save us. Yeah, absolutely. Which means what about the one who can save us? What does that say about him? He's powerful, right? He's powerful. And this is precisely what Matthew tries to say about Jesus. If Matthew's point is to say, this is who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. As Israel's Messiah, and then therefore humanity's Messiah, what Matthew tries to do is use miracles, is use teaching to uphold this idea. If you look at the very beginning or toward the beginning in Matthew chapter 2, we see from the very beginning that Matthew is up to something. Verse 1 of Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Right? From the very beginning, Matthew wants you, the reader, to understand that Jesus is the king. That Jesus is the savior. That Jesus is the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus as his rightful place, as being the savior, as being the Messiah, overcoming temptation from the devil. In Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, that really incredible section of text called the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus claiming his ability to give teaching and law on a certain level. The miracles show Jesus' power to heal. Okay? The teaching of Jesus shows his authority to interpret So Matthew is chock full of these stories. All the way to the end of the gospel in Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus gives this great commission and goes and tells his apostles and disciples and followers to do the same thing. Not in the same authority as Jesus, but with the authority of Jesus because Jesus is going to be with them. So they don't have the same authority That Jesus has himself because they're not deity. But every bit of authority that Jesus can give to them, what does the text say? He gives to them. And ultimately, it's not even as if that authority is theirs. It's because they carry along Jesus with them. So Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the one who can save. Now, Matthew writes primarily to a Hebrew audience. And so Matthew's point is to reveal this great message primarily to the Hebrew people, to the Israelite people, to the people living in and around Jerusalem and Judea. So if this is the point of the Gospel of Matthew, and it's not that there are no other points, there are plenty of other points in the Gospel of Matthew, but if the primary point that Matthew is trying to make the people understand that would read his work is that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, what should that do to us? Or what could that do for us in our ministry and in our preaching and teaching? What does that mean? Why is that important for us to understand? You think about the miracles of Jesus. Jesus sees with eyes of compassion. He constantly heals. He gives sight. He gives food. He calms the weather. Why were the miracles necessary? To prove to people who he was? Absolutely. It was hard to change their mind. We're not going to talk about this when we talk about the Gospel of John, but you think about in the Gospel of John as Jesus is interacting with the Jews at the very beginning of his ministry, he goes into the temple and flips over a table because he's so angry at what they're doing. And at the very end of his ministry, he does the same thing. And despite everything in between, All three years of active ministry of Jesus, they don't want to listen. Many of them, many of them don't want to. So the miracles were necessary to seek to prove the authority of Jesus. Why else? Why were the miracles necessary? As the world was created, God had relationship with man in a way that we really can't fathom. They knew the sound of his footsteps. 
I don't know what that's like. But they knew God that much. I know what it's like to have a three-year-old run into your bedroom at 2 a.m., right? Maybe they knew him that well, right? You know what that sounds like, that pitter-patter, right? But they knew God that much. And in the fall, and nothing is unchanged. Everything changed. Everything changed. The trajectory of our relationship with God changed. The trajectory of man's relationship together changed. Sickness, right? Hard work in the ground. Everything changed. And so as Jesus comes... Jesus serves as a testimony to the way things were supposed to be. And through his miracles, he makes those things right with the people that he interacts with. Blindness wasn't a part of the creative order. Cancer wasn't a part of the creative order. Death wasn't a part of the creative order. And so Jesus comes and shows his ability to heal all of those things. What should that motivate us to do? If Jesus heals and Jesus serves not only the cause of man through miracles, but also ultimately to be a testimony to who God is and why God created. Because he's revealing that he is the Messiah, the Savior, the Chosen One. What should that motivate us to do? So we put our trust in Jesus. Absolutely. What else, Calvin? Believe, right? Love. Is that what you said? And so there is this, I think, idea for us. I think in at least part of the motivation that we see in the ministry of Jesus himself, specifically in the Gospel of Matthew, is that we have a tremendous message to teach. But we also have tremendous opportunities to work, to do, to heal, right? Now, we don't have the ability that Jesus has to raise from the dead, regardless of what you've seen on TV. But we do have the ability to go to people who grieve and say, this is who Jesus is. And even through the way that we live and the way that we comfort and the way that we encourage and the way... We have the ability to say, through our life, this is not the way it's supposed to be. If Jesus spends his time with the hurting, then at least in part, we should spend some of our time with those that hurt. Whether it be physically, emotionally, or spiritually. To rub shoulders with those people because we do serve the Savior. The Messiah. Who spent a great deal of his time with those people. So that's the Gospel of Matthew right in eight minutes <laughs> gospel of mark jesus is god's son jesus is god's son mark was probably the first gospel recorded i wouldn't 100 percent commit to that but most people say that mark was probably the first one that was recorded which you might find a little interesting jesus is god's son Mark 2, starting in verse 1, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, which is interesting because Jesus didn't have the New Testament. So Jesus was preaching Old Testament text, I think that was, and you'll see. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Now, you ought to bold this in your Bible, or at least in your mind. Son, your sins are forgiven. We are 2,000 years removed, or so, removed from this story, from the life of Jesus, that sometimes we take for granted what a scandalous statement this was. So because we have had our sins forgiven, we know who Jesus is, we've been brought up knowing who Jesus is in many instances, and those of us here tonight know who Jesus is, we know that he saves sins, we read that and we say, yeah, Jesus is doing what he did. But in a first century audience, with a bunch of Pharisees around, the fact that Jesus would say, son, 
son, first of all, your sins are forgiven. Immediately they would have been enraged. And the best case scenario would have been the Pharisees would have thought to themselves, who in the world does this guy think he is? Now, what's really interesting about the first century is that there are rabbis walking the streets of Jerusalem and Judea who have some power. I mean, they can even do some things. Miraculous even. Not like Jesus, but they can do some things. It's the time in which they lived. But what sets Jesus apart from all of those guys is that he goes to people or he interacts with people who come to him and he tells people, your sins are forgiven. I don't know that they were trying to trick him because Jesus says he saw their faith. Linda want to know if maybe they were trying to trick Jesus because later in the text there's some doubt about Jesus' authority. It's a good question. It's a great question. I think that a lot of people in the first century were just seeing shadows, right? They weren't seeing everything. They didn't understand everything. They only understood in part what Jesus was about. So these guys, I don't know what their level of faith was about Jesus' whole Messiahship. What I do know about these four friends is that they have enough faith in Jesus to know that he can heal their friend. Now, whether or not they understood exactly everything that meant, I don't know. But I do know that they believe with all of their heart that they would destroy somebody's home so that they could get their friend to Jesus. These four guys are friends of the paralytic. Can you imagine somebody ripping apart your deck or somebody ripping apart your roof who you don't know? That's the level of faith that these guys have. And keep in mind that the house was way more important to them than it even is to us. This was the center of trade for people. This was not just the house, this was the household. There are multiple generations living under this roof. So it's not just like, oh, somebody's breaking through my roof. Somebody's breaking through your grandma's roof, right? Which is a whole nother level of disrespect. If you break through my roof, we're going to have an issue. But if you break through my grandma's roof, we're going to have a real big issue. You know what I'm saying? And that's what's going on here. But these guys are willing to risk that because they believe that Jesus is can heal their friend. So they do. And Jesus, he interacts with this guy. And the text says in verse five, Jesus saw their faith and said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. What's amazing is immediately Jesus doesn't heal him. Now he's going to heal him, but he forgives sins first. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? Why would they say that? Because from their perspective, they, they have the authority of God himself. And God himself would not allow anybody else to forgive sins. Nobody else to forgive sins. So what's Jesus really saying about himself? That he is God. That he has the authority of God himself. This is why it's so scandalous. Jesus did not have the reputation, at least among the scribes and the Pharisees, of just being a pretty good guy and a really good teacher, which is the way a lot of us treat Jesus today. A pretty good guy and a pretty good teacher. For the Jews who were passionate in zeal, wrongly, but passionate in zeal for the Torah, this was sin. But what Jesus is saying is, I'm God. And this is why theologians like C.S. Lewis would say, there's really no middle ground with Jesus. You see, even those who are diametrically opposed to the purposes of Jesus have more of a passionate reaction than many followers of Jesus do today. Because they know what's at stake. They think Jesus is not God, but Jesus is God. And immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves said to them, they didn't even say it out loud. And Jesus knows, which is always interesting to me. Like Jesus eavesdrops on your thoughts, right? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and walk. And he does. Jesus claims the authority 
of God Himself. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus claims the authority of God as He calms the weather, as He teaches about faith. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus claims the authority of God. Jesus spends much of this gospel announcing that He has the ability to not only heal, which is primarily what Matthew has focused on, but He has the ability to forgive sins. And that's the difference in Matthew and Mark. Matthew wants you to know He has the ability to heal you. Mark wants you to know about Jesus is that Jesus has the ability to forgive sins. It's a two-sided thing. It's a two-sided thing. What should this truth motivate us to do? If you look at Mark 15, starting in verse 33, the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his laugh. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who's a Roman, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man is what? Son of God. At the beginning of the gospel, Jesus claims authority as God's son. By the end of the gospel, you have a Gentile saying he's God's son. So what does this truth motivate us to do? It is awfully easy. I don't speak for you. I speak for myself. I think that probably we all have this in common. Individually, but also collectively. It's awfully easy to go one direction or the other. And what I mean by that is, it's easy to spread the message that Jesus can forgive sins on a certain level. It's easy. It's easy to teach, but not do. I mean, I, I'm talking about myself here, okay? But then you have a, a whole segment, a whole generation, let's say, upcoming generation who really, really, really wants to do. They just don't want to teach very much. And the reason I think that Matthew and Mark are side by side is because it takes both. And those ideas are not mutually exclusive. Those ideas work in concert together. Jesus can heal. Jesus is also God's son, which means he has authority to tell you how to live. It takes both. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to do both perfectly as individuals or even as collective. But it does mean that we ought to think about attempting to do both. Okay, the Gospel of Luke, I'll say the Gospel of Luke has been my favorite gospel for a long time, probably since college. Mark, I don't know what your favorite gospel is. What is your favorite gospel? John, yeah. Not surprising, Mark's a counselor. His favorite gospel is John. Luke's always been my favorite gospel, probably because it's the longest. I'm kidding. But Luke has always been my favorite gospel. And ultimately, this is why. I've never forgotten my New Testament teacher as a freshman at Lipscomb in 2002, it was the last Friday of August. And he said, ultimately, Luke says, the gospel is for all. The gospel's for all. And I've never forgotten that. And I don't know why. It isn't always interesting what you remember. But I can still, in my mind's eye, place myself in that classroom and look outside and see the quad and know what the weather was like on that day. And that truth has been seared in my memory. The gospel is for all. And that was the first course that really, I think, opened my eyes to the reality of how differently the gospels are. They're the same, but they're different. They ultimately say similar things and they talk about the same person, but they reveal different sides of his character. The gospel is for all. Who this is written to, Theophilus, some people suggest it's actually not a real person, but more of a group of people. But it's a Gentile. The point that Luke makes about Jesus over and over and over, all the way from who this was originally intended for, those that love God, lovers of God, 
Jew or Gentile alike. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Luke chapter 2, we see something really interesting that doesn't happen very often in the context of the first century. In Luke 2, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to custom. And when the feast was ended, they were returning. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. He's in big trouble, right? But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And they did not find him. They returned to Jerusalem searching for him after three days. Can you imagine what mom was thinking? Three days they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers. This did not happen. This is unheard of. Listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And his parents saw him. They were astonished. And his mother said to him, guilt trip, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for him? Do you know where I'd be? From the beginning, we see that there is something unique about Jesus. But more than that, this is the only story, one of the only stories we have from Jesus' childhood. Which is really interesting because children were insignificant. Totally and utterly insignificant until they came of age. There's no other literature from this time upholding the virtue of a young person young people are dumb right they got stuff to figure out not here and just to prove to you that jesus isn't the only exception who does jesus constantly say you must be like to enter the kingdom of heaven like children you know where that happens in the gospel of luke over and over and over again the gospel's for all. Not just for people who have it figured out, not just for smart people, but even for young people who have some things to learn. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus cleanses a leper who is unclean according to the law. In Luke 7 and Luke 8, he heals two women who are unclean according to the law. One because of choices that she's made. The other because of a disease that has ravaged her body for years. And in all three instances, Jesus goes to those people who are on the fringe of society and seeks to reconcile them back to God. In Luke 10, Jesus lifts up a Samaritan. It would be the equivalent of somebody telling a parable today and upholding somebody who's a former member of ISIS. Now, that makes us a little uncomfortable, doesn't it? That's how they thought about Samaritans. Almost to a T. In Luke 15, you got a lot of lost stuff going on. A lot of irresponsibility going on. And Jesus talks about him as the one who goes and finds. Jesus talks about a prodigal who is reconciled to his father. It does not matter what you have done. Your father is waiting to run to you. Something else the Gospel of Luke does that was scandalous, probably more so than even dealing with children or lepers, was that Jesus interacted with women. Because women were lower on the totem pole than children were. And Jesus is constantly surrounded with women, allowing them to have a foretaste of the kingdom of God. Luke repeatedly announces the good news of salvation. And this is the good news, that anybody can be saved. I think sometimes we've convoluted that term and we've complicated that term. Good news. It's good. The good news sounds good. Good. It's good. And so when you hear something that somebody says is the gospel, but it doesn't sound good, they're not preaching the gospel. The gospel is good. It's good. That Jesus is the way to salvation and it does not matter what you have done. The Father runs to you once you start that journey back. Once you take that step over and over and over. Sick people, sinners, people on the fringe of society, children, women, lost, 
whether they made the choice or somebody made the choice for them, Jesus interacts with them. The gospel's for all. What should this motivate us to do? I think we've got to consider the company that we keep. And I don't mean that the way we typically say it. I'm not suggesting that we're constantly surrounded. But I think it's important for us to think about being around the kind of people that Jesus was around. And those are people who hurt. And those are people who are sick. And those are sinners. Those are people who've made poor choices. We've got to be around those folks. Because we can bless them through revealing who Jesus is. Because there's good news. And it's good. You don't have to stay the way you were. Last one. The Gospel of John. And I'll tell you why we did this tonight. Believe in Jesus. Now there's a lot of things the Gospel of John does. Right? One of the things the Gospel of John does is to tell you Jesus can be believed. In John chapter 6, starting in verse 35, we won't read the whole text, but Jesus starts this series of I am's. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. I am. In John 7, 29, I know him for I come from him and he sent me. I come from God. You can believe in me. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. This is unbelievable. This is remarkable about Jesus. And what John wants you to understand, what John is showing about the life of Jesus is that you can believe in him. He is trustworthy. He is who he says he is. He did what he said he would do. What does John say at the end of the gospel? If I could recount every story of Jesus, it would literally fill up creation because there are so many. That's how much evidence there is to suggest that Jesus is trustworthy, that he's good, and that he can save you. Whether it's teaching or miracles or ultimately his great love for people, he's worthy to be believed in. These truths, I think, motivate us to spread that message of love, not only through our words, but also through what we do. There's a lot that the New Testament does in revealing who Jesus is. And specifically, these Gospels, there's a lot of other things they do other than what I just said tonight. But what I want you to know is that regardless of where you are spiritually, weak or strong, Jesus has something to say to you. Regardless of where those around you are spiritually, weak or strong, Jesus has something to say to them. Regardless of if you spend your days around believers who are passionate about Jesus and you get to talk deep theology, Jesus has something for you to do and for you to say. Or... If you are constantly around non-believers, the job that you have right now, you're constantly around people who don't know the Lord. Jesus has something to say to them. That's why four Gospels. That's why different motivations. That's why different revelations. Because wherever we are or wherever we may be, there's always more. And it's always good. So as we think about preparing for Easter... I want you to know that Jesus is good. I want you to know that he's trustworthy, that the gospel is for everybody, that you can believe in him because Jesus is God's son and he is the Savior. And so maybe tonight we're going to offer an opportunity for you to respond if you need to. You have misplaced that faith. You've put it somewhere else. Maybe you've never initially come to faith. So that's a perfect opportunity for you to do what countless people have done for 2,000 years and intertwine your story with the story of Jesus through coming to him, taking that one step and he'll meet you the rest of the way. But a lot of us have already made that choice and we've been immersed. We've become believers. Maybe you've misplaced your faith. Maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe it's just weak and you want to ask your church family for help because you have been convicted through the power of the word that Jesus is believable, that he's good and that he can help you with whatever you're going through. You can take care of that right where you are. What Mark said today was right on the money. 
This is just a matter of convenience for us. You can respond to the invitation anytime. Anytime. But if you want the prayers of your church family and the encouragement and love of your church family, we humbly and freely offer you that. We love you and we'll help you any way that we can. Let us know what we can do if you'll come forward while together we stand and while we sing.